Thank you for coming. I'm sorry to call you. Listen, we had a report of a disturbance at your house, and there were shots fired. Is your husband Michael? Okay, I'm sorry to tell you, ma'am. He's been killed. No, 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 no. He's, he's been killed, ma'am. I'm sorry. No, to no, no, no. Listen. No, no. Try to calm down. No. On the morning of August 5th, 2009, 26-year-old Dahlia DiPolito left her townhouse located in Boynton Beach, Florida to go to the gym. She paused her workout to check her phone and saw a missed call from a number she didn't recognize. She called back and it was the police. Something terrible had happened to her husband, Michael. They asked her to drive back home immediately. As she turned onto her street, she saw police cars, camera crews, and forensic investigators on her front lawn. A police officer told Dahlia that her husband had been killed. Later that day, a distraught Dahlia was being questioned at the police station. She can be seen looking defeated in an interrogation room before seeing someone in the doorway that shocks her. It was her husband, alive and well. Michael DiPolito grew up in Philadelphia, where he battled drug addiction for most of his younger years. He was in and out of rehab during his 20s, but eventually fell into drug dealing. Wanting to make a change in his life, he relocated to Florida and began working as a telemarketer. The company that employed him turned out to be a scam, but Michael thrived in this profession and discovered he was a natural salesman. When the scam business inevitably dissolved, Michael decided to set up his own telemarketing operation. In 2002, he was arrested and convicted for unlicensed telemarketing, communication fraud, and grand theft. He was sentenced to two years prison. He was released in 2005 with an extended probationary period of 28 years and was also ordered to pay restitution of over $200,000 to his victims in small monthly installments. Michael was still struggling with drug abuse but worked hard to get sober and in 2007 married his longtime girlfriend Maria. That same year, Michael started his own online business, Mad Media, selling ad space and offering SEO services. The business was doing well, but his marriage started to suffer. In October 2008, Michael decided to meet up with a sex worker while Maria was out of town. That was when he met Dahlia Muhammad. Dahlia was born in New York, but was raised in Boynton Beach, and unlike Michael, had a stable, typical childhood. She started sex work at age 19 and helped run several escort agencies in South Florida and California. She also worked as a real estate agent part-time and appeared to be quite well off. It was love at first sight for Michael and Dahlia. They met up again the very next day and Dahlia waived her fee. Just a few weeks later, Michael filed for divorce. A few months later, Michael proposed to Dahlia with a $26,000 diamond ring. Michael's divorce was finalized on January 28, 2009. That same day, he bought a newly renovated three-bedroom townhouse in an affluent neighborhood for $238,000. He paid for it in cash. Dahlia was the realtor and received the commission from the sale. They officially tied the knot just days later and enjoyed a comfortable life together. Michael ran his successful online business from home and Dahlia would show houses a few days a week. Michael was still on probation and had been maintaining his sobriety, so the couple was limited in their activities, but still enjoyed dining out, going to the gym and beach, and watching movies and reality TV together. However, as the months went by, Dahlia became increasingly frustrated that they couldn't travel beyond Palm Beach County. At the beginning of March 2009, Michael's probation officer showed up to the home with a search warrant and 10 police officers. There had been three anonymous phone calls made about illegal drug possession in the house. The police conducted a thorough search but found nothing. The couple decided to distract themselves from the unsettling events with a romantic getaway at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Palm Beach. However, they were confronted by police again after receiving an anonymous tip about drug dealing occurring out of a grey Chevy Tahoe, the same vehicle Michael drove. The car was searched but the police found nothing. At the end of that month, Michael and Dahlia were enjoying a day of shopping together. As they made their way to their car to drive home, a specialist narcotics team was waiting for them, along with a sniffer dog. They had received yet another anonymous tip about a large amount of illegal drugs being stored in a grey Chevy Tahoe and proceeded to search the car. This time, they found a small amount of cocaine hidden under the spare tire. 
Michael, who knew that cocaine possession violated his probation terms, was shocked and broke down in tears, exclaiming he had no idea why there was drugs in his car. He claimed he had never even opened the floor covering where the spare tire was stored. He explained to the authorities that he had been sober for six years and suspected his bitter ex-wife may have planted the drugs there to get revenge. The officer leading the search believed Michael and let him go, but not before noting Dahlia's oddly calm demeanor. Michael was too shaken up to drive home, so Dahlia got behind the wheel. Michael ran through all the possible scenarios of how the drugs got into his vehicle. The only person who knew about their stay at the Ritz-Carlton and that they were out shopping that day was Dahlia. Nobody else had access to his car either. He asked Dahlia if the drugs were hers and if she had forgotten about them. Dahlia saw red at the suggestion. She reacted by accelerating up to 190 miles per hour. Michael had to apologize profusely to calm her down and begged her to slow down before she got them into an accident. Four days later, two police officers were dispatched to the DiPolito's home in response to calls from neighbors reporting what they believed was a domestic disturbance. Michael and Dahlia were questioned separately and both stated that they had a verbal argument the previous night and both denied a physical altercation took place. Plus, the officers did not observe any signs of physical violence on either Michael or Dahlia or throughout the home. When the officers left, Dahlia decided that was the right moment to announce to Michael that she was pregnant. Over the next few weeks, more strange occurrences left the DiPolito shaken. Dahlia received a strange phone call from someone who claimed to be Detective Hurley, but when the couple inquired at the police station, they were informed no such detective existed. The couple also found a threatening note left on their car after a gym session. The note demanded money and also included a phone number. When they called the number, a woman on the other end threatened to kill them both. Michael was growing paranoid and desperately wanted to end his probation. He hired a lawyer who negotiated a deal to end his probation if he could pay off the remainder of his restitution of $191,000 in full. Dahlia was going to contribute $91,000 and Michael would transfer her $100,000 so she could pay the lawyer in a single transaction. It should have been a straightforward process but they kept hitting roadblocks. First, Dahlia's money transfer from her account in the Cayman Islands bounced. Dahlia then asked her friend to lend the money. The friend agreed, but wanted the house to be signed over to his name until the debt was paid off. Michael's lawyer became frustrated and dropped him as a client. Michael considered selling the house so he could pay off his restitution, but Dahlia was worried about their unborn baby. She had already started preparing for the arrival of the baby buying pregnancy books and picking out names. The couple had also entered marriage counseling. In July, Dahlia told Michael that her friend recommended a lawyer who could get him on administrative probation while he paid off his restitution. This would make the terms of his probation much less strict. The lawyer told Michael he should sign his house over to someone else's name because owning that asset might hinder the process. By the end of the month, the house had been signed over to Dahlia. Just five days later, Dahlia would receive the news that her husband had been killed. Let's rewind a few months and go back to March 17, 2009, around the time the DiPolitos had the run-in with the police at the Ritz-Carlton. Dahlia reached out to her ex-boyfriend, Muhammad Shihade, who she had been seeing on and off for the last eight years. Muhammad worked at a convenience store and had recently separated from his wife. Dahlia told Muhammad that her new husband was abusive and Muhammad gave her the contact details of a police officer. The next day, Dahlia and Muhammad met up in person and she surprised him with a gift, a $38,000 Range Rover. She asked him for help and he forged a bank transfer receipt from an account held in the Cayman Islands. Muhammad had ties with the notorious Buckwild gang and at one point met up with Dahlia at a clothing store that the gang frequented. Dahlia loudly announced she was looking to hire someone to kill her husband. Some gang members offered their services, and Dahlia even drove them to see her house and show them the area. But Muhammad later warned them that Dahlia and her husband had both recently been involved with the police. The gang members agreed it would be too risky and backed off. Muhammad then sold the Range Rover back to the dealership as it was a very conspicuous car. On June 20th, Dahlia and Muhammad met up again and Dahlia admitted that she was trying to frame her husband for probation violation by planting drugs in his car. 
She told him she was also trying to figure out a way to get their house signed over to her name. On July 31st, the two met up again and Dahlia asked Muhammad directly if he would kill her husband for her. He refused, but told her he could put her in touch with someone who could do the job. Dahlia agreed. She had come prepared and handed over $1,200 in cash so the hitman could purchase a gun. She also gave Muhammad photos of her townhouse and of Michael, her husband, the target. That footage was taken from a hidden camera inside Muhammad's car. From their first meeting, Muhammad realized that Dahlia was being serious and went to the police. He had known Dahlia for years and understood her better than her new husband did. The police needed more information, so Muhammad agreed to be their confidential informant. The hidden camera footage from Muhammad's car was enough for the police to take action. It was late afternoon on the 3rd of August. Dahlia and Muhammad met up with the hitman who would carry out the job of killing Michael DiPolito. Dahlia got into a red convertible to speak with the hitman while Muhammad stood beside the car. But as we can see, this car was fitted with a hidden camera as well. The hitman was actually undercover police officer Witty Jean. They discussed his $7,000 fee and organized Dahlia's alibi. And when Officer Jean asked Dahlia if she was sure, she replied, Okay. It was undeniable evidence of solicitation. On the morning of August 5th, 2009, Michael DiPolito was in bed, recovering from his recent liposuction procedure. His wife, Dahlia, had just left for the gym. He then heard a knock on his front door. It was the police. They informed him that his wife had hatched a plan to have him killed and told him to wait at the precinct. Coincidentally, the popular reality TV show Cops was following the Boynton Beach Police Force at the time, capturing the day-to-day -day action of the officers. The police decided it would be great evidence and great television to stage an elaborate crime scene in Michael's front yard and film Dahlia's reaction. They brought in forensic investigators and taped off the area. When Dahlia showed up, the cameras were ready to capture the whole performance. Everything was going to plan. The police transported Dahlia to the precinct for questioning, still playing along and treating her as if her husband had been killed. Back at the fake crime scene, a search of the Chevy Tahoe revealed Dahlia had taken her designer handbags and thousands of dollars worth of jewelry with her to the gym. Her plan was to make Michael's murder look like a botched robbery, so it wouldn't make sense if her valuables weren't stolen. At the police station, Sergeant Paul Sheridan, head of the Major Cases Unit, took Dahlia into an interview room and continued the act. He asked her if she could think of any reason why someone would want to kill her husband. She told him about Michael's history with drugs, his telemarketing scam, and his subsequent conviction. She told the sergeant that Michael was due to testify in some upcoming fraud cases and that he also owed his mad media business partner $40,000. Sergeant Sheridan told Dahlia that they had a suspect, a man who was seen running from her home, then brought in Officer Witty Jean, who was handcuffed and dressed in casual clothes. Shortly afterwards, Sergeant Sheridan informed Dahlia, You're going to jail today for solicitation of murder. You're under arrest. That's an undercover police officer. Dahlia denied any wrongdoing. Michael had also been questioned, and he told the police all about his suspicions. The anonymous tips, the drugs planted in his car, the strange phone calls, and the convoluted restitution payment attempts. That's why today, honestly, I'm not very surprised or shocked about all this. No. Sergeant Sheridan revealed to Dahlia that Michael was alive, to which she replied, thank God. Michael was brought to the interview room and stood at the doorway. Dahlia was taken to the county jail where she called her mother, denied she had done anything wrong, and demanded that Michael leave her house as it was under her name. Dahlia's next phone call was to Michael, the man she wanted to kill. She begged him to help her. The police had already shown Michael all the hidden camera footage of her clearly soliciting a hitman, but she said none of it was true. Hello? Yeah, what's up? I don't you understand what just happened? What they're saying is not true. How in the hell did I hear it and see it? I heard what you heard. It's not true. I heard what you heard and I saw what you saw. Everything they showed you, they showed me. And how is it not, how are you telling me that? I it's not true. Michael said he would help her if she signed the townhouse back over to him, but Dahlia refused. 
Dahlia was released on $25,000 bail the next day and placed under house arrest at her mother's home. The Boynton Beach Police Department released the video of the stage crime scene online and the story went viral. Michael appeared on several talk shows where he shared his perspective. He was still in total disbelief about the whole situation. It turns out Dahlia was never pregnant. She wanted to distract Michael who was getting suspicious that she was behind all the anonymous police tips. She had tried to take matters into her own hands and kill Michael herself by putting poisonous antifreeze into his Starbucks. Dahlia had also been in constant contact with another ex-boyfriend, Mike Stanley, and she convinced him to help her take her husband's money and house so they could start a new life together. Mike Stanley called the house pretending to be Dahlia's obstetrician, and he also pretended to be the lawyer who advised Michael to sign the townhouse over to Dahlia. On April 25th, 2011, Dahlia's trial began. Her defense attorneys argued that Michael was reality TV obsessed and masterminded the hoax to achieve fame and secure his own TV show. They claimed Dahlia was aware she was being filmed by hidden cameras the whole time and was simply playing along with the stunt that Michael had planned. The jury disagreed and found Dahlia guilty of solicitation of first degree murder. She was sentenced to 20 years, but the case was thrown out after an appeal found the jury was improperly selected. She was placed under house arrest again and had a baby sometime in 2016. Her second trial in 2016 resulted in a hung jury despite the overwhelming evidence. After six years on house arrest, Dahlia's third and final trial took place in June 2017, and this time, the jury took only 90 minutes to return a guilty verdict. The judge sentenced Dahlia to 16 years. Her appeal in 2019 was rejected. Dahlia is currently serving her time in the Lowell Correctional Institution in Florida. Her son will be 16 years old when she gets out in 2032. Michael DiPolito, now 51, gave a few more TV interviews to discuss developments in Dahlia's case, but is currently engaged and running his own real estate agency. The court had also ordered the townhouse to be signed back over to him. Mohammed Shihadeh, the whistleblower who prevented Dahlia from carrying out her plan, was found dead in his apartment in October 2021, aged 40. 